Fellow makers, crafters and builders, my name is Nathan Wheeler and this is the Irish Maker Podcast. This episode, we are talking about the Irish space industry. Oh boy, do we have a lineup for you today. And the first great captain of the enterprise once said, a sense of the unknown has always lured mankind and the greatest of the unknowns of today is outer space. Today, we're going to be talking to the three of Ireland's pioneers in the space industries. We'll be talking about Ireland's first satellite, STEAM education, the STEAM web space telescope, and how you can join Ireland's growing space industries. Our guests are Dr. John E. Ward, a space product manager at Rialta Space Engineering Systems, Dr. McKeown, a star of the Big Life Fix on RTE, an assistant professor and lecturer in the School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering, and the engineering manager for the AirSat One, a project to build Ireland's first space satellite. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Neve Shaw, who's an academic and space communicator, who's passionate about igniting people's curiosity, space exploring, space exploration, and she combines her degrees in engineering, her science PhD, and her performance and her communication to create theater, public events, workshop, and lecturers to share the human story of space and science. But first off, I want to talk to John E. Ward. So John is a space product manager at Rialta Space System Engineering. He has a PhD in experimental astrophysics from UCD. He carried out postdoctoral research ground-based gamma ray telescopes in, in Arizona and La Palma, as well as cosmic ray balloon experiments launched from the Spew Swedish Arctic and Antarctica. That is very, very impressive. After his career in academia, he worked as an applied physicist and a business developer at a space startup in Barcelona, which launched two nano satellites as part of a constellation for Earth observation. At Rialta, He's a main program role manager of the Independent Video Kit, or Vicky, which was a camera system for the launches which recently flew on the Ariane 5 that launched the James Webb Telescope. He's passionate about growing the space industry in Ireland and supporting young scientists and engineers who wish to pursue a career in space. John, how are you? Hey, Nathan. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. No worries, John. I'm just looking at your resume and I'm absolutely just blown away. I've never felt so um, uh, felt so inadequate going through someone. No, I think that just means I'm much older than you, probably. So <laughs> I wouldn't read too much into it. But uh, yeah, it's been a meandering and uh, very career so far. So. so, John, let's just jump straight into it. What got you involved in astrophysics? Like, how do you get started in that? Like, what made you pursue this opportunity in academia? So for me, uh, it was growing up in Donegal. Um, I'm originally from Glanties and the area surrounding my town is uh, really dark, you know. And so for me, growing up, uh, I was really used to seeing incredible night vistas uh, and the stars. And my father would take me out to, um, you know, go stargazing. So I think from a young age, I was kind of brought up um, with, with that. And... You know, in secondary school, I was, you know, reasonable at mathematics and physics. I had an interest in that type of of, uh, of world. And so it just seemed natural to me to to try and combine that that um, that skill set of, of physics with, with astrophysics, with my interest in the night sky. And so there was a degree at the time, uh, still going, in uh, Maynooth University, and uh, it was physics with astrophysics. So I decided to... To, to put my hand to that and um, just one thing led to another and I, I ended up spending several years as a you know as a scientist um, just studying the origin of cosmic rays um, and various other various other topics and it all started being up in the glenties looking at the stars yeah yeah absolutely um, I think it's it's really a shame when uh, you know, people grow up and they don't really get to see what a proper night sky looks like. Um, and, and and it's something, you know, with light pollution and obviously growing up in cities and more urbanized um, upbringing now that, that people are missing out on. But for me, I was really lucky to, to have that. Um, now, granted, it is Donegal, so it was cloudy probably 90% of the time. But when it wasn't, it was really impressive. That's amazing. Like, like it, It's such an interesting role how you went from looking at the night sky to essentially building parts of rockets, which just... I mean, that, that absolutely blows me away. I want us to talk about that because that, to me, is just blowing my mind. So tell us about Rialtra Space Systems. How did you get involved in building? So you, you built part of the rocket, sorry, part of the video kit for the Ariane 5 that launched the James Webb Telescope. So tell us about that. Yeah, so um, 
Realtra Space Systems Engineering is a it's a space startup. It's based in Dublin. Uh, it's located in the um, in the north of the city, and it began in in late twenty eighteen. Now at the time I was in Spain, I was in a, a new space company. Uh, we were developing um, nano satellites or cubesats for a constellation to do Earth observation, actual machine to machine communications, and also aircraft tracking. So I had left academia at that stage and I was involved in, let's say, the, the new space um, world. And But I'd been out of Ireland for like eight to nine years by this stage. I, I'd gone to the US and in Spain and I wanted to come come home. And I knew at the time, just from reading, that uh, there was seemed to be this potential and, and actually a kind of a growth in the space industry and, and interest in space in general in Ireland. And I wanted to be a part of it. So I just kind of went on Google and, and reached out to some people that I knew and Realtra was mentioned to me. So I just literally sent my uh, sent a message through their website and I got a response. And a week later, I was in Dublin for an interview and a week wow. later I had the job. So I was extremely lucky because, you know, Realtra is quite small at the, at, at the time. It was smaller and it's still small. You know, we're maybe 10, 10 people. Um but growing and uh, we've more projects and employees almost at this stage. So um, it just began that way that I wanted to get, to be involved in space um, in Ireland and just reaching out and being lucky enough to, to get a job. And how competitive is the industry? Because I'll be honest, before we got talking to you, I had no idea that there was any space systems companies in Ireland. Is there an awful lot of other companies doing work? Are they doing work for the ESA or is it mostly for universities? Uh, can I have Tell us a bit about the industry. Yeah, so um, it's interesting in the sense that Realtra, I would say, is the only company that's fully dedicated 100% to making products for space. So uh, about Realtra, you know, its uh, main focus is is producing avionics systems for, for use in space. Now, that can be on, on rockets, on launchers, or it can be on satellites, on the International Space Station, on the Lunar Gateway, for instance. So Realtor itself has been involved in this video kit, which was a, a, a video, a high definition video system that we produced for the Ariane 5 and Ariane 6 launchers, which are the European um, heavy lift launchers. And um, But in addition to that, you know, we're involved in European Space Agency projects, such as the ESA Plato mission, which is an exoplanet uh, hunter um, and that's a, a large satellite mission that we're producing a, a mission critical piece of hardware for to control the temperature of the telescopes and basically focus them. But also, um, you know, we do stuff related to machine learning, et cetera, uh, and applications. So in that sense, we're quite unique. Um, however, the industry in Ireland in general, there's there's several companies, there's tens of companies at the moment that um, do projects with the European Space Agency. Um, which can range from producing some mechanical pieces for uh, at the Ariane 5 launcher, for example, um, gyroscopes for satellites, uh, avionics systems as well for, um, you know, for, let's say, the Boeing Starliner is an example. So there's a lot in Ireland that's kind of underneath the surface uh, in terms of um, project work. But, um, you know, the, the idea now, and there was a national strategy launched by the government in 2019, a national space strategy. I think the idea is to, to really grow that and, and double the amount of employees in the, in the industry, mm -hmm. um, expand the number of companies involved with the European Space Agency. I think they want to have like a minimum of 100. At the moment, it's, I think, about 60 to 70. Um, so it, it is, it's rapidly expanding and growing. Um, and I think it's, it's a great time to be involved in the space uh, industry in Ireland. So there is great growth potential then for the Irish industry. Do you see an awful lot of people in academia or people in your company who are just really, really excited for this? Or is there kind of a small amount of growth? Or do you see the industry growing an awful lot in the next couple of years? No, I think um, I think people are really waking up to the fact, uh, even at the government level now, that um, space doesn't have to be this kind of inaccessible um, thing. Um, it's... I think they see that there's a great opportunity for technological uh, advancement um, and also, you know, employment opportunities, high quality jobs in the country. Um, the European Space Agency, you know, Ireland contributes something like 20 million euro a year to the European Space Agency. And that money is supposed to return to Ireland in the form of contracts. So it's called the geo return policy. And so actually what we need is more companies to access and unlock that money because um, Ireland at the moment is a small country. 
uh, with you know a, a, re- a relatively small number of companies, and uh, we need to have more to to unlock more of the the potential. So, one thing I think people are maybe seeing is that there's opportunities for themselves to begin their own companies in Ireland, and that's something I think I'm a, a huge proponent of. Is that instead of it being done by state actors or large incumbent companies, we really need to have younger people are, are not even younger people that are interested and, and driven yeah. uh, to start their own companies and try and um, uh, produce things for, for space. So just one final thing. So as someone who's actually, you've built a part of the Ariane, the Ariana, is it sorry, the Ariane or the Ariana? Uh, it's the Ariane, Ariane so, 5 launcher, for example. Or so when you were building the uh, video kit system, what were the main see, challenges in actually building that? Because obviously we're a show full of makers and I'd imagine there's a bunch of people sitting at home going, Oh, I'm sure that isn't that complicated, but I, I have a feeling it's probably immensely complicated. Well, it's it's in some level not complicated. Uh, so I, I would take the point, especially in the, in the realtor approach. So let's say when I, when I talk about old space and new space, old space is, let's say, the, the traditional way of, of doing, um, of developing products for space, which meant extremely low risk, but then correspondingly high cost and long schedule because you have to take a lot of time and you have to spend a lot of money to make sure that this thing will work 99.99999% of the time. And it's it's fair enough, you know, these things go into space, they're inaccessible usually. But what that mean was, what that meant was is that the barrier to entry is extremely high because it took a lot of capital investment to get into that world. So you see just a handful of incumbent companies. SpaceX kind of changed the game because, you know, they were funded essentially independently by a billionaire and kind of threw out a lot of the rule book about how things are to be done. They took risks. They were happy with higher risk um, and they did, they folded that into a rapid development cycle. What that's done is it really shook up the way things are done. And then the introduction of the CubeSat format, which was essentially a, a great way to uh, reduce the cost of developing small satellites uh, and then the advance of microelectronics and stuff really allowed um, universities to enter and small businesses to enter that space market. And that's, let's say, the new space side of things, which are, um, I would claim, higher risk, but lower cost and shorter schedule. Realtra lives in both worlds. So we do the new space side of things, which is the way we do that is we take commercial off the shelf products uh, that are usually for, you know, uh, automobiles or in flight testing equipment and in, in aviation. And we, what we do is we ruggedize those systems and prepare them to survive for the space environment. So the, the complexity in terms of the video kit for us was taking these, let's say, COTS components, which are lower cost, but making them survive the extremely violent launch. Um, so you have to understand that when you're launching something on a, on a rocket, it's essentially a controlled explosion. Um, and then you have various things like vibration, shock from the fairings which is the cone of the launcher being broken apart with pyrotechnics or pyro bolts um you know so you have shocks coming into your systems you have radiation you have huge thermal um variation in in orbit so you kind of have to test your system to make sure it can survive all that so the complexity i would say in terms of um developing for space from our side is um testing so one of the things that that Came, that's in Ireland and it did not exist in Ireland before was the ability to run a full test campaign from concept to delivery of flight units. And weirdly enough, it was the COVID pandemic that that allowed us to actually develop that, that capability in Ireland. So we can do shock testing in Ireland now, thermal vacuum testing, um, vibration testing, all in the, on the island of Ireland, which is something we didn't have before. So um, that's like a really... Um, I would say that's the, the the part that we have to focus on a lot, and that's where our competency in real comes from. Um, Thank you so much, John. To be honest, I want to get straight into the space industry stuff in the uh, round table, but I'm going to just hold on there because there's so sure, much. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> I'm going to try and jump over to uh, David now. Thanks so much, John. No problem. So David McKeown is an assistant professor and lecturer in the School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering over in UCD. His current research focuses on the modeling and control of large flexible aerospace structures and the testing and verification of attitude determinations and control systems for nano satellites. He's an engineering manager for AirSat1, a project to build Ireland's first satellite. It's an amazing endeavor. He's a founding member of the UCD Center for Space Research and of Dublin Maker 
and at the Science Hackathon, and you might have seen him on RTE on the show Big Life Fix, where Ireland's leading inventors create ingenious solutions to everyday problems for extraordinary people. David, how are you? I'm really good, Nathan. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. For the listeners listening, I met David uh, at Dublin Maker about four years ago, and he I had all these costumes out, and he just kind of wandered over, and he was like, cool. <laughs> And then he kind of wandered off again. And then I kind of met him later on for a pint. And I'm like, you thought my stuff is cool. And, and he's like, yeah. And I was like, what do you do? And he's like, I build satellites. And I was just like, oh, that's pretty cool as well. <laughs> Your stuff is really cool, Nathan. <laughs> I'm Tell sorry you know, I wasn't more uh, eloquent when I met you first. <laughs> <laughs> but I was concise, if nothing, nothing else. That's the best way to be. So tell me, what got you interested in mechanical materials engineering? So, so how do you go from starting off to go to university to be like, oh, I'm going to build a satellite. Oh, that's a long way. Yeah, so I, I, I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering uh, in UCD. So how I got into that, I, I, you randomly pick something at CAO. It seemed, I didn't have a clue what engineering was. You know, I, I mean, I had a kind of clue, but not not really. Just got an uncle telling you, you build bridges or something. Um, <laughs> then I liked it, so I, I kept it up. And um, then I never left, which is the, the case of most academics. So I. Um, did four years undergrad and then four years for a PhD. Um, and during the PhD, uh, I was, you kind of hit on there, I, I was doing control of flexible systems. So things that are big and wobbly and uh, long and flexible, how, how we move them around without them vibrating. Um, and Is that a big issue of vibration? Yeah, it depends on what you're doing. Um, so in space, it's a big issue. So if, if you're a space telescope, imagine you're a space telescope, Nathan, and uh, you want to go, you're looking at one star, and then you want to look at another star, and you want to get there as quickly as possible. Um, just, you're I, very... I think you just explained the entire point of the podcast, looking at different stars. <laughs> um, so go we'll go. We move very fast. And when we get there, because the structure is so light, because we have to make it light to get into space, it starts vibrating. And it's a bit like uh, if you have a shaky hand and you're trying to take a photo with your camera, you get this blurry shot. Um, so the idea is moving it, but in a certain way that when you get there, you don't get the vibrations and you're really steady. Uh, so like, like you have a tripod for your picture. Um, so we're looking at that problem, but we're generally looking at space. And uh, I was at a conference with my, my then PhD supervisor, uh, William Connor, and we'd given a talk about this uh, area. And at lunchtime, a guy from the European Space Agency sat down beside us and said, this could be kind of handy for uh, space. Uh, we went okay, and uh, about ten years ago now, we got our I got our first uh, space contract looking at a, a, a X-ray telescope, IXO. It never got built, International X-ray Observatory. Um, and then we went and looked at some robotic arm stuff again, picking up things on Mars um, and the vibrations again. You want to precisely pick up something or precisely drill something. You don't want the vibrations. Uh, which then led to looking at rocket engines and, and, and control of the actual rocket itself as it went to space. Uh, so the slashing fuel inside and the flexibility of the structure. But how do you make the rocket go up straight? Um, which uh, that's, that's kind of what we were doing. And then AirSat uh, came along, uh, which was this project uh, that was led by my colleagues over in physics uh, in UCD. Does it does it ESA education have this fly your satellite program where um, you, you, you say we want to build a satellite, and they go, OK, we'll help you a bit. We'll provide you the launch, but you build the whole thing, and we'll give you some uh, access to our experts. So uh, you see pitch for that and, and won uh, one of these launches, and that was five years ago. So they figured out, apart from physics, physics we need some engineers to build this. Uh, so I came on board uh, with some of my team, and we've been doing this for the last while. Um, that's got into actually building our own satellite, as opposed to building part of it or looking at a control system, actually taking over the whole thing that you, you have, you're responsible for every part, uh, which is a different type of engineering. Um, yeah, so that's how we kind of, kind of fell into it a bit. Uh, I guess when I started my PhD, I didn't know we we're going to end up doing this, but it's, it's good fun. So we've been just going along for the ride. Uh, and no one's figured this out yet. So we'll keep, <laughs> we keep going. Tell, yeah. tell me, for people who don't understand how satellites work and um, myself included yeah. how do you go about building your own satellite because i guess when i think of kind of uh, them building spacecraft or satellites i just think of these hyper clean rooms and people in like these little suits and everyone just running around and scientists everywhere is that really how it is or is it more nuanced uh we do have two clean rooms uh yeah so uh, we 
there's a, it's not. It's, it's people in hoodies and jeans um, and building it in, in labs. Most of the time, we're not in the clean room. Um, so you go, uh, you, you make your design. Uh, so in, in, on, on paper or more on computer, um, and you say, this is what it's going to do. It's going to get this hot. It's going to need this amount of power. It's going to communicate this way. It's going to do this thing. Um, and you write it all down. And you have design review and some experts say that's rubbish and that's good and that's bad and then you go on based on once you pass that when they're kind of happy enough that maybe most of it works or the idea is good or that you can build it but you still have to fix and solve a lot of things you go on to actually start starting to build it um so we have uh there's a clean room in physics there's a clean room in engineering so the clean room in engineering we built this year and it used to be a kind of a walk-in fridge uh, kind of thing, uh, which is now being converted into a clean room. So when you, in the kind of makery, hackery side of things, um, we go and put a filter in that and, and cleaned it and now have a lovely clean room. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of, once you get it to the right level of dust, it's a clean room, basically. Um, and then over in physics, we have a proper clean room uh, there as well, which, which was, was actually meant to be a clean room. Um, so when we're assembling satellite, we're in there. So I think that that's actually flight hardware, or uh, we built what well, we we built two models. We built a engineering qualification models, which is the kind of twin of it uh, that we we built first and tested, and then we build the flight model that actually goes to space. So if, if either of those were getting worked on, it's in the clean room. Uh, outside of that, we we are kind of demo models. If we're building a new part, we can just do that on a lab bench and, and kind of test it with normal normal dust that happens in the university. Lots of it. Um, and what's the satellite actually going to do? It's going to do lots of stuff. Um, it's going to do three as three payloads. Um, so one is a gamma ray burst detector, and we call it GMOD. Uh, so when big explosions of, of uh, neutron stars or black holes doing stuff in the universe, uh, that travels all across into a kind of crystal that's in our satellite, which generates light. Then we see that light, and we can detect these gamma ray bursts. Um, so that the, the physicist guys are, are interested in that. Um, we have a thermal coupons on top. So these kind of uh, uh, pieces of material that have been coated very specially that have very good uh, thermal properties. Um, they're made by a company called Mbio, uh, who have also coated Solar Orbiter, which is an ESA project that's, that's on its way to the sun. Um, so we're testing how, how well they work in low Earth orbit. And then we have a thing called wave phase control, which was actually the topic of my PhD. Uh, but it's how we control the uh, satellite while it's in space. How do we orientate it? So we can turn AirSat into a magnet because we have coils uh, going around our solar panels uh, and we've put electricity through a coil, you get a magnet. And then the Earth is also a magnet. Um, so if you repel or attract based on how you, you put the electricity through, you can turn your satellite using magnetic forces uh, up there. And how much you should electricity you should put in to, to twist it, there's an algorithm uh, in there and that's, we call that wave-based control. So we're gonna test that up there. Uh, so the three main payloads, we also built our antenna deployment module which is at the bottom of our satellite. Um, there is, so a cubes, it's a CubeSat. So it's about, uh, can you see my hands? It's about that big, it's 20 centimeters yeah. tall, uh, 10, 10 by 10 centimeters uh, on the other sides. It has to be all of that form factor, but our antennas come out much bigger uh, to uh, communicate. So we coil them up and store them in the bottom of the satellite. And then after it gets launched uh, up in space, uh, they, they spring out. Uh, so we built that mechanism as well. Uh, a bit like Johnny was saying, we had to space qualify all that. So we had to shake it and bake it and uh, make sure that it's, it'll survive at launch. Uh, and when are you expecting to actually launch this? Oh, I, I'd have to kill you if I told you, but it's, um, we're, 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 I can tell you we're, we're very close. <laughs> we're very close. So I can't actually tell you exactly publicly now, but uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're planning over the summer to, to be, to, to be, Pretty much finish this satellite and, and then the launch not not too far after that so we're basically being five years working on this uh, and i don't think we'll we'll get to year six um so yeah we'll get into the the real meat of it so at the moment we're assembling the flight model uh we're integrating it is what we call it so we were we're, we have all the parts it's all being kind of tested on, on a what we call a flat sat so before we assemble it we have a kind of a board level on a table all connected up and we bring it together into the full satellite. Um, and then we're, yeah, when I say shake it and make it, so we, we vibration test it. We put on a big shaker and, and, and shake the daylights out of it. Then we put in a thermal vacuum oven, heat it up, cool it down, um, and make sure everything works. And then it, it gets qualified as, as a full satellite then. 
Um, and then it's about a lot of documentation, but how do you build a satellite? You write a lot of documentation. Um, is, is that so we, we, we've written so much. Uh, so everything has to be proved, uh, all, all the analysis that's going to survive on paper, that has to survive on tests, and then um, operations. So we have a ground station uh, on the roof of the physics building, um, and we'll probably have a lot more. Uh, so we'll have some uh, all over the place, and we, we'll probably tap into something called the Satnog network, which is kind of distributed uh, ground stations all over the world uh, that anybody can build and get data back there. Um, so we have all operation phases. Once we launch, then we have to, someone has to actually look at the data and make sure everything's working okay. So we have a big operations manual that's that's ticked uh, that we wrote. I just have one final question for you before I um, we head out to the next guest. I saw on Instagram there the other day, you were getting something laser etched onto the satellite. Um, oh yeah. What was going on there? Yeah, well, we were, we're, we're, kind of, we're big on our public engagement side of things as well. So we, we, uh, we worked with uh, some uh, junior cert libraries, uh, especially in, in desk schools. Uh, we wrote, uh, they wrote, the students that came in uh, were writing poems around AirSat and, and space uh, and amazing. working with uh, UCD, uh, the poetry there, the creative writing department. Um, and they curated the, a poem uh, basically uh, taking lines or words and stuff from all these uh, junior search uh, poems I made a, a kind of one poem and then that got etched onto the bottom of the flight model now in the kind of uh, Emer Boyle, the artist uh, in residence in UCD uh, in kind of a tentacle kind of shape but it's the words of the poem on the back uh, on the other side, that's on, on this antenna deployment module which is the, the last bit uh, on the other side of it is the names of those students and, and the names of the team are etched in so uh, yeah, it's kind of that's amazing. So, That's David, cool. thank you so much. I want to chat more about that, about the satellite in the round table, but I'm going to pan over now to Dr. Neve Shaw. Dr. Neve Shaw is an academic and a space communicator who is on a mission to see the Earth from space in order to share a totally new perspective of our planet and of ourselves. Through her work with STEM, STEAM, and mainstream audiences, Neve has witnessed firsthand how understanding space better can awaken in us our shared human endeavor at the heart of science, making life on this planet better as a collective. Since uh, consolidated by her qualification in practical science, communicating from Cambridge University, Neve's work firmly places the legacy of David Attenborough into ordinary people's hands, inspiring them to take ownership of a part of the world and seek to change it for the better. Neve, how are you? I'm grand. I'm actually dosed with the cold. I'm sorry. I'm quite croaky. Uh, Nathan, <clears throat> so please excuse me. Sorry for my voice. <laughs> no worries at all. Listen, I want you to, if you can, tell us what being a space communicator is all about. Well, it's kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, it's kind of what I want to do. You know, it's um, it's something I've always wanted to do from, from a really young age. You know, I'm too old to be an astronaut. I don't have what it takes to be an astronaut. So, so how can I fulfill my own personal dream? Um, how can I bring it to life, the, the parts of me that come alive when I when I think about space? And I guess it's combining my ability to connect with people. Um, I love science. I love explaining science and I love space. So so that's kind of what I did. I, I sort of have wandered into this identity, which kind of brings together all the different parts of me that are that are essentially rooted in the one thing, which is. I would just do anything to um, to see the earth from a distance. And I think the best qualification I have is is using my skill to explain and to and to connect and not be afraid to be vulnerable and um, and share all the stupid ideas that come into my head. And if I'm afraid, so try to humanize it. So, so that's what what I call a space communicator. But it isn't a job. It's it's sort of a necessity. You know, that's the best way to explain it, Nathan. That's a great way of looking at it. So you obviously left college. You've got a background in science and you've yeah. worked in theatre and you've worked in films. And, and now you're doing all this and you're communicating right across yeah. the world. And every time I look at your Instagram, you seem to be at a NASA launch or giving a talk and presenting. So you must have a huge amount of face-to-face uh, -face contact with people and explaining the joys of space. And how do people react to that? I love it. Um, 
people are great. Like ESA have really, um, it's it's thanks to ESA, you know, the European Space Agency, yep. that all that's possible because they've added me as part of their media, you know, because they, they really like what I do. So it's thanks to them that I'm able to get to NASA because I'm there, not not just as sort of a randomer, I'm there to communicate what's, what's happening on the ground. Um, and I think people like talking to me because I'm not threatening. I'm not trying to be a reporter. I'm not trying to be technical. I'm always trying to think of ways of explaining something um, using words that are outside of the of the dictionary of, of space and science, because I'm always thinking about the person who has just sort of happened upon this conversation and they're interested, but they don't really know if, if this conversation is for them or not. So, so I, I try to use everyday words. I try to find everyday analogies and, and ways of breaking down any fears that people have around the subject of space or science. And I think people like it. I think, you know, like you've seen Johnny there and, and David, like they're the Irish version of, of the kind of other people I meet around the world and they're the experts. So my job is how can I make what they do uh, how can I bring it closer to people who don't live in the realm of, of science, who haven't been lug- haven't had the luxury of doing a degree in engineering or science? And, and that's making it accessible. Making it accessible. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, lots of people do what I do. But I think the difference is, is that the way I'm trying to go about it is probably a little bit different than, than the way most people go about it. Yeah. And in terms of when you're you're obviously doing an awful lot of media work for the European Space Agency, is there yeah. anything big on the horizon there that you can tell us about? Anything that's that's going to absolutely blow people's minds in the next few years? Well, I think the James Webb Telescope, you know, um, it's amazing that Johnny's involved in that. I think once we start getting data back from that, you know, so this is a telescope that was launched on Christmas Day, but it took years. Like people were waiting for years for it to be launched <clears throat> because everything about space takes time. Mm. And this is a telescope that promises to really answer the bigger questions about understanding the story of our universe. As humans, we have a tendency to put ourselves at the center of everything, you know? So when I was in school, I was told that we were the only system of planets around a star. And once they started using stronger telescopes and started focusing at different constellations, um, you know, in our night sky, they realized actually most stars have planets around them. So we always have to keep changing the story. And we really feel that with the James Webb telescope, because it uses infrared light and the and the different um, um, light recording mechanisms that are on board called spectrographs and spect- spectrometers, um, they're going to be able to look much further and much deeper into the early stages of our universe, which they believe may change the story that we're talking about and about the age of our universe and and all the different stars and how stars are formed and everything. So that's going to be huge. Another big one is, and I was there for the rollout of this of the spacecraft, but it's still it's still no further on. Like, is the um, we're eventually going to get back to the moon. And I was lucky earlier this year um, on St. Patrick's Day, they rolled out the rocket that's going to make that happen. And on top of the rocket was the capsule that's going to have the astronauts on board called the Orion capsule, which is which was partly built by um, the European Space Agency. And um, they're still in the testing phase of that. They were kind of hoping that they'd be further on than that. But they're hoping, I would say, hopefully by the end of the summer or maybe September, they're going to launch that and orbit the moon and then bring it back in a kind of a 20 or 40 day uh, round trip. And if that's successful, then they're going to put a crew on the Orion capsule and they're going to orbit the moon and come back down. And on the third trip, and all of these missions are called Artemis, which is the which is the sister of Apollo. um, They will eventually put people back on the moon and the very first woman will be on the moon finally. So that's huge. And that's going to kick off a whole new phase of human space exploration where there'll be a permanent space station around the moon and then ultimately um, a habitat for 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 research purposes. And all of that is about us ultimately sending people to Mars for us to understand what happened that planet and, and, and how similar is it to Earth or is it similar at all? You know, so these are huge things. But everything about space and you've heard about Dave and you've heard about Johnny, everything is 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 on a much longer scale than what we're used to. And that's a given. And so um, you just have to be patient, but amazing things are coming. And and tell me, as a woman in the industry, how have you found it? Um, I I guess when we think of astronauts, we we tend to have this very masculine kind of uh, of it. What is it like being a woman, especially in the European Space Agency? 
Well, the lovely thing is like this year, they, they, or last summer, they had a call for their astronauts, you know, and there, I was talking with <clears throat> the director general, Joseph Ashbacher, and he, um, they're going to be announcing their final selection. They think they have about six or eight um, in November, which is when the ministerial is, the ministerial is when the European Space Agency decides together using all the different member states, what they're investing in and what their priorities are. And at that meeting, and they're going to announce who the new batch of astronauts are. And he was saying that they're down to the last 400. And at the moment, it's 50-50. It's 50% women, it's 50% male. And that's huge because I think, Nathan, the reason why I have come to all of this quite late in my career is that even though I grew up in a house where it was perfectly normal as a girl to be an engineer or as a scientist, I didn't see a female astronaut. For some reason, I didn't know about Valentina Tereshkova, who was the first woman who went into space in 1962. And I hadn't heard about female astronauts growing up. We didn't go to NASA. We didn't do those kind of holidays as kids. So if I think of this current generation and I think of the, the kids that are coming before and if we continue to have parity across uh, gender and ethnicity, what happens is, is that everybody sees themselves part of the story of space and that will transform who owns it who gets to have a say in it and who tells the story of space you know so as a woman um that's great to see it really is it's very encouraging that's absolutely brilliant i'm going to bring yeah. everyone back in here okay right? so many questions that i want to ask everyone right. uh, so guys i want to jump straight into it thank you again it's, it, my mind is absolutely blown like you're hearing people talking about oh yeah i built satellites and yeah i just build things on rockets and i'm going to NASA every other day it, it's it's so out there for an awful lot of Irish people that they're probably thinking like oh that's that's not something we do so I want to ask this question when we think of space and exploration the mind usually jumps to NASA in the states or Baikonur Cosmodrome operated by Russia or the emerging player on the scene China we generally don't think of Ireland as playing any sort of role in the space industry so how true do you think that is in terms of public perception because you're saying there's an awful lot going on I guess for a layman like me, it just seems like that it's so far removed from Irish society. Steve, you want to take us? Yeah, I think I think Ireland is is hugely involved in it. It's just um, it's just not a you know. I I think Johnny said it, he was on a, a session and um, was on the space careers at me, and I think Johnny said it really well. It's just that Ireland is sort of focusing on this new this new section. And Johnny, maybe you, sh you should talk about it. Is that what we're doing isn't like you know um, the big guns like SpaceX or or Planet Labs or any of these big rocket companies, but like because we're a member state of ESA, there are a lot of people. Uh, involved in once in one sense or another in in the space sector i think the day we have an irish astronaut and i think that's coming i think then people will start to kind of see it there's something about a human face i think does kind of help people hear the story clearer but but johnny what, what would you say about the sector i think the point about the uh, irish astronauts a really good one putting a face to to our um our involvement in 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 space um I've found that, you know, at conferences, et cetera, when I say that I'm from a, an Irish space company, uh, I've, I've had people literally say to me, oh, Ireland has a space industry. I've had that happen a few times. And um, I think that's unfortunate. And I think it's probably something that can be very easily solved through people like yourself, Neve, and, mm. and, and David with Airsat1, um, that we, we just will need to make more noise about everything. And that's certainly a name I have, and it's a name of Realtor as well, to actually not just be uh, a company, but to be, uh, let's say, a pioneer on an example of um, Irish space industry. And that's something we're very proud of. So I think we can do more for sure. And um, I'm just glad that people like Neve are, are making those sounds. Yeah, I mean, I find... Even the awareness of ESA, European Space Agency, it can be can be quite low. Uh, so a lot of people, are, oh, so you doing stuff with NASA? And I'm like, who are they? Are they the American ESA? I, I don't I don't understand. So uh, yeah, that we have our own space agency that we're, we've been part of for, for many years, and and it does a lot of cool stuff, and there's, there's been Irish people involved. Um, so again, awareness, AirSat. We are we're trying to use it as a as a vehicle because it, it's uh, to help. Just generally with public, um, so we, apart from from her poem at, at the bottom, we, we have a lot of um, stuff going on. So we're going to have a data hub so people can see the data publicly available that's coming back from AirSat. Um, 
uh, and also the idea that you can you can build your own antenna and maybe even schools and, and see data coming back down um but try to give the ownership it, it's a it is an irish satellite and it's <laughs> got a lot of uh, hassle to, to make it an, an irish satellite um as opposed to trying to register it somewhere else or or, or or that which might have better regulations in place already to do that but we're, we're very much important so we're interested to see how people will react uh, to having whether they'll care or not or um will they get excited um so uh yeah there's more to do it i, I think the new space you know, we don't have this giant prime, you know, company that makes full rockets or big, you know, full satellites, you know, uh, you know, half a million or half a billion euro satellites. So it's, it's not visible, but we can have a lot more smaller, cooler um, companies doing good, good stuff like, like Johnny's doing there. And uh, every good news story like they had with the James Webb uh, telescope pictures you know, gets it into the press and, and gets people thinking I could do that because, uh, you know, if, if a small Irish company can be the, the focus of a world, you know, the pictures of the world for a day, sure, you know, we could have a good few of those here. Uh, so, yeah, there's more to do, but I, I think I think it's changing. Yeah, actually, one, one thing I, I just on, on that point uh, that David brought up, and I think Ireland um, as a small country, but like a global country in some level is actually really, really interestingly placed to benefit mm. from uh, a space industry growth through, let's say, the smaller company side of things, a more org organic bottom up approach, because we have this incredible access, you know, trans like transatlantic into the US market. We're very interested in all island approach as well. So there's, you know, a nascent industry in Northern Ireland that we collaborate with access to UK and then pan European through the European Space Agency and the European Union program for space. So Ireland's actually extremely well um, centered to access all of those worlds. And, and I think if we really push, let's say, that more dynamic, small company attitude, uh, I think we could do really well. Uh, one additional point I, I should have brought up, though, um, is that there is a, an entity, NISA, and, and Eve will speak to it, called Izero. Uh, it's the European uh, Space Education Resource Office. And just recently, they they organized a, a, something called the CANSAT competition in Ireland. I was lucky enough to be a judge of it, which is an incredible program where you launch, you have secondary school students build what is essentially a miniature satellite that fits in a, in a, a soda can, which is an Americanism. Uh, and then you, you launch that on a small rocket and it was launched from a, an estate in like a, a gentry estate in Port Leash. And these were, you know, secondary school students that were participating in this and, uh, you know, so the capabilities are here as well. Um, and I think that's why it's so important that we keep pushing it because we've really, really talented young engineers and scientists as well that we need to keep in the country. So that's why if we have an industry to give them jobs, they can stay. <laughs> but to follow on from that, a lot of our listeners are probably thinking there is no way to get involved in the space industry. Um, but you guys have obviously successfully navigated that. So what advice would you give to them to people who are sitting here listening to this kind of going oh, i wonder if i could do that like how do i break into that because obviously there isn't the same kind of pipeline that the usa have where they take the test pilots and then you kind of go down the military route whereas we're very much focused on what the more academic route so what advice would you give individually to people who are coming up and they're kind of interested in space the very small percentage of people are test pilots and end up as astronauts so there's so many people just end up in the space industry who are who are lawyers and chefs and designers really? and store yeah th these are massive companies that have accountants and all sorts of stuff so there's engineering side of it but I, there's a lot more than, than that um in terms of formal stuff it, there is a, a a space science and technology masters in, in ucd uh, which is is a one-year masters which is probably the, the one that if you wanted a formal education that kind of tries to prepare you to go into the space industry after maybe doing a science or engineering degree or something, some computer science, something like that. That that might be a route if you wanted a one-year pivot. Um, but apart from that, uh, there's a lot of companies going from, say, doing something that's not space. They have a technology or a process or whatever. And and through um, but he said BIC, which is business incubation centers and stuff like this, trying to trying to either go one way or the other, where you either have something that's not terrestrial, that's non-space, and try to apply it to space, or ha if you have a space technology, try to play it uh, terrestrial. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd, I'd probably look at those ways. Do you guys yeah. might have other ideas? Well, I, I think it's like, what do you... So it's kind of like saying, I want 
I want a career in, I want, uh, I want a career in steel. You know what I mean? So, so what do you mean? So like space is such a, a big, it, it, it means so many things and it means different things to different people. What specifically are you passionate about steel or, or space? So are you, are you passionate about people? Are you passionate about um, astronomy? Are you passionate about astrophysics? Are you passionate about exploration? Are you passionate about science? Are you passionate about law? Um, all of those, like, because the European Space Agency is an infrastructure and a government agency, there are places and careers for all different types of people with different interests. Um, and, and the common denominator is it's it's this um, it's this government organization that requires people. And a lot of people are, are contracted. So there are different companies across Europe and they're like uh, recruitment agencies. And they and they advertise and sometimes they're looking for engineers, sometimes they're looking for scientists, sometimes they're looking for communicators, uh, writers, lawyers, accountants. So you subscribe to these different uh, recruitment agencies and you and you can, you know, you get your updates and you can get your um, alerts and stuff and things like that. So it's it's becoming um, a more mainstream sector to to work in. And it and it's really about why space what is it you know so, so I go back to it, it doesn't have to be space it's like what are you most passionate about what are you most curious about and that's the thing that that should lead you and I think when you talk about something that you're curious about what people what most people do they go oh I know Jimmy 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 McGrory sure he he works down the road and you should talk to him and that's what happens when people hear what you're passionate about people just want to help you so so be upfront about it and talk about the thing that you want to do and just get busy and and um and if it's a formal career then all the easier and like what david's saying like do one of those sort of um courses that will completely align you and connect you with the network that will formalize um a, a career path for you but even if you're coming to it late in life and even if you have um a qualification and something that you don't feel is directly scientific or engineering that doesn't necessarily mean you don't have a future in 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 the space sector yeah, and just just on that, actually, um, from my experience, reaching out to to people yeah. um, is is a big one. Um, just being willing to send an email, a cold email to a company, and expressing your own interest, and seeing, you know, is there a possibility of of an internship or some small project work, or coming in to visit to talk to people and building that network? I think is crucial because people are more than willing. Usually, <laughs> I've never had a negative experience to sending an email. Uh, you know, so. I, I think that people are, are really willing when they see someone that's inspired and interested and want to see how they can contribute to, to try and support that. So as a follow on to that, uh, I think David made this point. He was saying uh, ESA and then he went European Space Agency because there's an assumption that people probably might know that. And we kind of we feel that we need to spell it out. So the ESA is obviously operating with less than a third of the budget of NASA. But how does the work it does compare to, let's say, Roscosmos or the Chinese Manned Space Agency? Is it comparable work or kind of how are the different space agencies operating? I I think it's holding its own. I mean, it's it's one of the, you know, um, I was talking to the director general last week and he was saying that NASA were saying that they're one of their key global collaborators now. I mean, you know, the European Space Agency have their own funded um, science um, missions, you know, um, Rosetta was probably one of the most successfully communicated missions I think there that ever was. And I think it's really helped all um, space agencies understand how to tell um, tell the story of quite a complex science mission to the general public. And Rosetta was a mission where they had a probe and they landed it on a comet. Um, the probe itself didn't last very long, but the, but the actual spacecraft that hosted the probe, the Philae probe, um, actually kind of um, had a dance around the comet for, for a very long time. And, and we learned an awful lot about that, um, that comet and, and how comets operate and work. But it has its own, um, you, it's its own um, 
you know, independent um, rationale and strategy, which is what the ministerial is. So all the different member states get to submit ideas um, and proposals for different science projects, and then they make their decision. And based on that, that's how they go forward. And just like with all other space agencies, all these missions are 20 or 30 years in the planning and then another 20 or 30 years in, in actually happening. And I think the European Space Agency has been involved in the major ones. It's involved in the James Webb Space Telescope. It's involved in the Artemis mission, which is the next huge huge step in, in human space exploration and and onwards and um you know uh, uh and, and johnny johnny and david are directly involved in them in one way or another so i i think they're i mean i'm i'm obviously biased you know but but i i, I certainly definitely think that they're holding their own i don't know what john and david would say though i think that um the isa is exactly it's holding its own considering the the budget it has uh, and the sheer volume and number of, of voices that it has to kind of coordinate, you know, multiple nations, etc. I think it's, a, it's done a, a magnificent job. Um, I think it needs uh, an expanded budget for sure. I think, we, you know, the good thing about ESA is I would say there's there will be a direct correlation between an expanded budget and expanded science and, and industrial output. I don't think it's inefficiently run or anything like that. Um, so... From that side, I think it could use more money, but it's doing a great job. Um, one thing I think that maybe human space flight aspect of the European Space Agency could expand, as in our own independent capability to launch our own um, astronauts. And that's something I think maybe would be really interesting to look at in the future with the Ariane 6 launcher, the next gen launcher, if it could become human rated, et cetera. Um, but otherwise, I think ESA has its own interesting niche scientific work as well and it shouldn't be just a nasa too it should be a european uh did you know the european vision for it and i know sustainability etc is a huge part of that as well so yeah I, I think isa struggled from not being around in the you know the 60s and the golden age and where people think about you know apollo and the space race and, and that's why people think maybe russia and, and, and america um it was also quite weak on branding it's got a lot better over the last couple of years and people like me have helped think a lot but it used to be that you could buy you know nasa hoodies and pennies but you can't buy isa stuff or you couldn't even buy an isa hoodie when you went to isa technical headquarters yeah. and, and there was a shop that was open for an hour that you could buy That's right hand. um they've, they've sorted it out and i think it was a bit of a bureaucracy kind of thing that isa was non-profit or something they couldn't sell anything or something like this and um it's all right now you can buy nice isa merch and uh yeah, again, that people that, that yeah, it's our space agency, and that's maybe the hoodie you you should wear over NASA or if you want. Um, but it's we're we're getting better at that. Um, the moon will help again. I think, like Neil said, if you know that hopefully will will capture the stuff. And and actually, we're doing some moon dust uh, project for ESA on with robotic arms and and stuff like that. So there's, there's a lot of that that money if ESA is involved, which means contracts go back to companies and universities which means some of them are coming back to ireland and we get to capture the imaginations of people by having robotic arms and showing mundus at them so uh yeah i, I think it's i hope the isa brand is going to grow over over the next while and that that'll help people uh, feel ownership in ireland over over that and there's definitely a, a certain degree of an interaction between government-run agencies and obviously private companies becoming more into the fore. So obviously you have Musk, you have SpaceX, and they seem to be the dominating trends at the moment. Uh, they grab all the headlines and they seem to be the the, the real pinnacle of, or at least the perception is that they're the pinnacle of space engineering. How true is that um, from people who actually know the industry versus what's just communicated to the general public? But they're definitely <laughs> noisier. <laughs> um, so what happens if, you know, if you're a private company, you, you get to do your private, you know, you, you get to say what you want and do what you want. You're not, you're not working for the government or for, uh, you know, I guess traditionally a lot of the big space companies in America, you know, just did their thing and, and put up their satellites and, and didn't actually go around tweeting about it, uh, too much. Um, so, uh, there, there, look, there's been some great technology technology advances with, with some of the private space companies, reducible launchers and, uh, and this kind of thing. Um, and I, I'd put it down to some great engineers working in there. Um, and, and maybe not the, the guy shouting about it, but sure, look, I don't own the company. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it has pushed things uh, on a bit. Um, and, and I'd say 
uh, we've talked about Aryan five and Aryan six, and you know they would have ruled the roost, uh, doing a, a, a whole load of launches um, a few years back. Uh, I mean, they're still they're still doing that, and they still have a very reliable launch system. But it's kind of put pressure on the more governmental agencies to improve their stuff or, or to maybe advance at a quicker rate than they were they were happy to do uh, beforehand. So overall, I think it, it, it's quite good. I don't, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think they should take over completely. <laughs> all, we should be all, all private, but uh, it, it doesn't make for interest. It's entertaining. <laughs> it's entertaining if nothing else. I think there's um, a part of this that's that's becoming interesting that I'm seeing in the industry from, let's say, the, the quote unquote incumbents. So, you know, your large uh, satellite integrators and launcher companies uh, that they're in a sense kind of beginning to outsource their innovation or partner with smaller dynamic companies who are capable of, of kind of moving faster. Um, and so that's going to be quite an interesting hybrid approach, I think, going forward. Yeah, I think, you know, you can see that on the ground, like um, I'm kind of just echoing what Dave and, and Johnny have said already, but yeah, the public private partnerships are sort of, I, I think they're really helping um, accelerate things. Like it's been very interesting watching what I saw, the rollout of that rocket, the space launch system or SLS, and and how slow the pace of the development of that has been in comparison to seeing Falcon 9 and um and the Starship uh, uh you know from 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 SpaceX happening. And that's the difference between having you know shed loads of money and focus and not really having to tick so many boxes when you're when you're working on behalf of a government agency versus a commercial enterprise. But I think both have to exist and I think the safest way is when it's a public private partnership because kind of Dave's hinted at it a little bit there is that the one fear I'd have is with, with commercial enterprises is that they don't really need to explain themselves. And usually it's for profit, which means that ethics and the bigger, the bigger story of space, which is something that's very important to me can get lost in that. And, you know, for me, space has always been about exploration and seeing what's over the hill and, and for us to work collectively as a species and figure out our place in the universe and what it's all about. But, you know, space is becoming a very profitable business. And when you have these companies that are extremely powerful, if they're not working with a government agency, we just have to be sure that we know exactly what they're doing and that we are that we have some sort of say in where they're going, because, you know, people are talking about mining of asteroids and mining of the moon and and taking all these resources. And I don't know how I feel about that, because I feel like we've made enough, you know, we've we've, we've done enough damage on our own planet and um, I'd like us to collectively as a species make these decisions if we're going to start messing with other planets and other asteroids. But I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of an optimist and um, I can just see that the that the commercial part of um, of the space sector uh, can accelerate at a very fast rate. And uh, a big part of why I why I feel the need to communicate space is I just want to make sure everybody's on everybody knows as much as they can about it because we could be in a situation in 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years time where there's damage been done and it cannot be undone in the name of, of profitability. So while I love to see these big companies making these huge achievements and it's really exciting to see reusable rockets and seeing these rockets that are geared towards getting us to the moon. And um, I kind of am concerned as well about let's just make sure that we can, we can all decide together about what we're going to do with all of this, you know, Thank you so much. I have one final question, and then I'll let you all go. Um, it's one for each of you individually. Would you like to go to space if you're given the opportunity? Um, I'll go. Uh, I, I really don't have much interest in going to space. I've seen the engineers who make this stuff. Um, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, um, I'm only joking. Uh, no, uh, people, I get asked that a lot. And, and yeah, I, I'm not, I never really want to be an astronaut. I'm happy to make the machines that, that do it. Well, uh, I never actually wanted to be an astronaut, but I would go to space tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I've let go of wanting to be an astronaut, which is something I wanted to do as a kid. But yeah, I absolutely would love to go to space. I want to feel the discomfort of it um, to show people that we shouldn't be there. And every second we leave our planet, we are in extreme danger because I think we have the tendency to forget that we belong we belong on this planet first and foremost. 
And when you remove oxygen and you remove water and you remove food and just, you know, gravity and you're in the vacuum of space, it's extremely difficult. So I think we need to remember that sometimes. And it it, it should give context to the amazing achievements that we do every day, whether we're deploying satellites or anything, anytime we leave this planet. Perfect. Thank you so much to all the guests. I really, really appreciate you t- taking the time to come on to the show. Thanks, Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Thank everybody. you. I think that's the perfect place to call it. That's it from the Irish Makers podcast. A big thank you to all our guests. They have been really awe-inspiring. You talk to people about space, about engineering, and it always kind of fills me with a sense of awe. I want to thank our sponsors, Coding Grace, to Vicky Toomey Lee, who manages all the production for the podcast, and most importantly of all, to you, our listeners. You can follow the Irish Maker podcast on all social media or Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. You can find us anywhere and you can listen to the spot, the podcast on Spotify, Apple or Anchor, or as I said, watch it on YouTube. We release all new episodes every second Thursday and every week we release the Maker News Roundup, where we keep you up to date on all the Maker News happening right across the island of Ireland. If you are a maker and crafter or builder and want to be featured on the podcast or any maker news that you have, you can contact us directly. We are always interested in new people. That is season one of the Irish Maker podcast wrapped up. Thank you so much for all the guests who have appeared on season one. We were going to take potentially a little break. We'll only have a mini sewed out. And then we're right back into season two where we are going to be talking to the most amazing crafters and makers and builders from all over the island of ireland thank you so much and until next time live long and prosper <laughs>